Hey folks, welcome back to My Kitten Reads. I'm Eleanor, and this is a slightly spur of the moment book to adaptation video. Um, essentially, I didn't know what to film this week, and I've been thinking of it, and I literally just had the idea that I have seen two adaptations of two of my favourite books recently, so far this year, so in January and February. So I thought I might talk about them. Um, it is spur of the moment, so I'm not sure how intelligible my thoughts are going to be, but we'll see how we go. At least I'll be getting something out this weekend. So the first thing I went and saw in January was the new adaptation of Little Women by Greta Gerwig. So um, this is, of course, the story of the March Sisters. Um, again, it's a book that I've read a million times. It's one of my favourites. It's a classic by Louise May Alcott. Um, but this was a new adaptation. So previously I'd only seen the uh, one adaptation from, I think it was 1994, with Winona Ryder and Christian Bale and Susan Sarandon. Um, this was a very different adaptation um, in that it started more than halfway through the story. It's... And by the way, this video is going to be full of spoilers, probably, because I know that I, I know these books so well, and I know the movies, and so I'm just probably not going to, be able to talk about it without spoilers. Just a warning. So it's it starts when the movie starts when Joe, who's the main character of the uh, story, Little Women, she's the second eldest of the four March sisters. Uh, she's very independent. She's a writer, and the movie starts when she's gone to New York to stay with who in the book we know is a friend of her mother's um, who runs a boarding house to look after her children. Um, she's got two little girls. So the movie actually starts there, which is well after halfway through the book. Um, and so then in the movie, you've got these two timelines. So you've got the story going forward f from when Jo arrives in uh, uh, New York and when she is essentially... <laughs> I think if I remember correctly, the first scene is actually after she's been in New York a while and she goes and tries to get a story published with the newspaper and is told, yes, we'll buy it, but we'll have to edit a lot of the stuff out of it, like the morals and all that kind of stuff, because people want juicy story, juicy fiction, um, sensational fiction. Um, so it starts there. And so you then follow both Joe's journey forward from there, but also the story that's already happened from when Joe was a girl leading up to there um, in flashbacks. And they're usually flashbacks that tie in with whatever's going on in the forward story. So it brings a related scene or a related moment back from Joe's past to connect together, um, which is really quite fascinating. Um, I didn't really know, it took me a while to get used to, um, because I, I know the book so well, I'm like, why is it starting in the middle? This is really weird. Um, but yes, yeah, so it, that was really interesting. Um, what was also very interesting was that in a few places they did actually change what happens. Um, not in major ways. And I think in ways that improve the stories for a modern audience. So for example, I mean, this was a, this was fantastic. Like Amy March, who's the youngest March sister and is usually played by two different actresses, but in this case was played very well by Florence Pugh at all ages. Um, Florence Pugh. Anyway, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, to be honest. Um, but there's this, there's at least one scene in the book where Amy March as an adult who has been taken to Europe by their aunt March um, to study art and try and get a good marriage. Um, she scolds their childhood friend, Laurie, their neighbour, um, who has been rejected by Joe before she went to New York, um, and is therefore wasting himself away, um, being lazy around Europe, um, as he recovers from his broken heart. And so there's at least one scene in the book where she scolds him. There's a couple of scenes in the movie where she scolds him. But what I'm thinking of in particular is a point where she's scolding him in the movie and she makes this speech, which isn't in the book, but I think it's an amazing speech. And so I have heard that apparently this was written in like five minutes before they filmed the scene on suggestion of um, oh, brain blank... On the suggestion of Meryl Streep, who plays Aunt March. Um, anyway, that's what I've heard about it. But it's this speech where 
in midst of scolding Laurie about his behaviour, and when he tweaks her about, oh, so you're going to... It's surprising to hear a daughter of Mrs March talk about marrying for money. And she gives him this speech which is very pointed about the lack of options for women in the 19th century. She's like, well, I have no money. There is no way for me to earn money respectably. Not really. Um, yeah, America is probably a little bit better than Europe at the time, but you know, there's no real way for her to earn her living respectably. Um, then she says, if I did have money my ch and got married, my money would belong to my husband. My children would belong to my husband. I would be my husband's property. Um, so the only respectable life for me is to find a rich man to marry. Um, she's very blunt in this speech about the economic reality of women in the 19th century. Something that Laurie, rich, male, going to inherit his, um, uh, his grandfather's entire fortune, can in no way understand. Um, so she's very much, boo-hoo, my sister rejected you, get over it, and don't twit me about uh, marrying for money when I don't have any choice because none of my sisters are going to marry for money. At that point, Meg has already married a poor man, Beth is fragile in her health and very shy, and Jo is very independent, has already refused Laurie, and is trying to make her way as a writer um, and as a governess. So, which is the, really the only respectable way for her to earn a living, um, which is something that, you know, Amy is not going to be able to do. So, that was a fascinating speech, a very pointed speech, a very important speech when thinking about the history of women in the 19th century. It wasn't in the book, but I really, really loved it. The other thing I noticed, the other point I noticed that was a bit very different was actually very heartwarming, and that was at the end when uh, Friedrich, who is the man that um, Joe argued with but has fallen in love with and he's come to visit and then he's left without saying anything and she hasn't said anything, her sisters pretty much push her out the door and like, you're going to go and talk to this man and stop him from going away forever. And they get pushed, they push her clothes on, they push her into a carriage and then they push her out of the carriage and they're laughing and it's really, really sweet. So that doesn't happen in the, in the book, but I think it improved the film. So that is Little Women, directed by Greta Gerwig. Um, really good film if you get the chance to see it. Go and see it. I want you to take your tissues because it doesn't matter whether I'm reading, doesn't matter whether I'm watching the 94 film or apparently watching this new film, Beth. Beth's story always makes me cry. And in this particular viewing experience, I brought tissues. The teenage girls next to me had not brought tissues. I shared my tissues because I was like, we're all crying here. Uh, <laughs> so yes, um, that is Little Women, directed by Greta Gerwig. So the other thing I've seen a little bit more recently um, was the new adaptation of Emma by Jane Austen, uh, directed by Autumn de Wilde. So this is probably not my second favourite Jane Austen anymore. But one, I've always loved Emma, and I've seen many adaptations of this. So I grew up reading the uh, film cover version from the uh, Gwyneth Paltrow film. So I have a very warm attachment to the Gwyneth Paltrow film. It's also got Greta Sarchi. It's got um, Tony Collette, who's an Australian actress. It's got Jeremy Northam as Mr. Knightley. So I kind of love it. But... There's also Clueless, which is the modern adaptation from the early 90s, star, uh, starring Alicia Silverstone. There is also, I think, a 90s version, I think it was in the 90s, that ITV did, caught by with Kate Beckinsale as Emma. And then, of course, there is the Romila Garai BBC miniseries, which I love as well. So I've seen a lot of really good adaptations of Emma. So right up front, I'll say... This particular version by Autumn de Wilde, not my favourite. It's got a lot to live up to, and so it's never going to be one of my favourite adaptations. Um, however, it was enjoyable. I laughed a lot. And it's one of these few films, because I don't tend to notice direction a lot. Um, I really don't. But this in particular, I did, because 
This is Autumn DeWilde's first feature film. So it's her first feature film. Her career has been in photography and film for fashion and music videos. Um, so that has been her career. And you could see that influence on this particular adaptation of Emma. So one thing they did was they played up the farce. So Emma is probably one of the silliest of Jane Austen's novels. It's about this 21-year-old woman who's rich, she's beautiful, and she's got nothing to do except for matchmaking the people around her because she's slightly callous and she's like, I've never been in love, I don't really need to fall in love because I'm rich, I'm beautiful, and I'm already the head of my father's household and no, I can, so why do I need to be married? So I'll just marry everyone around me. Um, you know, and most adaptations, apart from Clueless, most adaptations are done very straight. So they're warm, they're Regency dramas, they are funny, but they're done very seriously. Um, this, they played up the farcical elements of the story a lot. So, um, yeah, so it did often feel like you were watching a French farce as people kind of did the wrong thing by accident and you could see car crashes happening and emotions and it was just like oh my goodness and laughing a lot so it was very much a french farce what you can also see is autumn dewald's um experience in music videos in particular um when it comes to the the extras like the supporting cast so often if it's people townspeople or if it's servants who are pouring tea or doing something they move in a specific choreographed way that makes it look like a music video. So um, this is probably also enhanced by the fact that the guy that played Mr. Knightley is actually a folk musician <laughs> so and has actually done at least one of the songs, a couple of the songs for the soundtrack. Um, so, but you can see the way the camera moves and the way the supporting cast moves it's, it's like it's a music video. They will move in perfect unison or perfect opposite to each other. Um, and then the colour palette sort of and the costumes, you can see her background in fashion because while they are still Regency era costumes, the colour palette, palette is very, it's still in pastels, but it's very sharp and bright pastels. Um, and then some of the embellishments, instead of just like a, a chain with a cross or a delicately beaded necklace, you'll have someone wearing this ruff of lace that matches the colour of their dress. Um, or, for example, the hair of Mrs Elton, the first time you meet her, is like this glorious, it's amazing, it's this hair that's flat and these massive ringlets, which is kind of normal, and then this massive, almost plastic bow, black bow on the top of her head, and it's completely ridiculous. But you can see that kind of stylistic influence from dealing with fashion and from dealing with music videos um and and some other modern things like for example uh, mrs goddard's students uh, mrs goddard being the woman who owns the school where harriet lives um so they they will suddenly walk through the picture and they're all wearing red cloaks with red hoods which is very reminiscent of the handmaid's tale um or are they wearing white bonnets i can't remember but, um, but yeah, I've seen that mentioned in articles. So you suddenly get, you have pastels, 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 and then these two lines of girls just walking through the, you know, giggling and laughing in these bright red cloaks. Um, but yeah, so that's just the very specific influences of a first time director whose um, career has been in fashion and music. It's, it's the color palette, it's the choreography of the minor players, um, and it's the use the emphasis on the farcical nature of this story where no matter what good intentions you have everything just goes bizarrely wrong to the point where at the end where um you got that scene between emma and mr knightley where they're finally realizing they're in love with each other and suddenly emma's nose starts bleeding and it's just this bright pop of red which i've also seen mentioned in like articles and reviews and stuff and so this possible proposal gets suddenly falls apart because her nose is bleeding. Um, it all turns out the best, of course. It's Jane Austen. It all turns out happy in the end. 
But it's, and it, like I said, it's not going to be my favourite version of Emma, but it was certainly entertaining. And it was certainly really interesting to see a new female director coming up from this world of fashion and music and what she can do with a feature film. Um, and the fact that it made me notice the direction. Like, I noticed it before I even knew who Autumn De Winter was. De Wilde was. Um, I think it's Autumn De Wilde. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, didn't know who she was. But I, I noticed the choreography and I noticed the brightness even before I read anything about it. Like, as soon as I saw it, I noticed these things. So, um, that was really fascinating. Also, shout out for Bill Nye as uh, Mr. Woodhouse, who usually is quite a dour figure in adaptations because he's Emma's father and he basically is obsessed. He's a hypochondriac, obsessed with his own health, obsessed with the fact that people keep leaving him to get married. Um, and usually quite a dour character. And then you've got Bill Nye still doing these things, but like in a hilarious way, like he suddenly goes, I feel a draft. Do you feel a draft? It's over there. And he'll go searching for it. And he's got all these massive fire screens to stop him from getting too warm in front of the fire. And it's quite ridiculous. Um, but Bill Nye, Bill Nye is just a delight in this film. Like he honestly is. I'm pretty sure he's the only actor I knew who he was. Um, there's not a lot of hugely well-known actors in this film, but yeah, Bill Nye was a complete and utter delight. So that is the two book to movie adaptations I have seen recently. Uh, Little Women by, uh, Louise Mar Alcott, adapted for, by Greta Garwig. And Emma by Jane Austen, adapted by Autumn D. Wilde. So, and you know, one thing I love, both adapted by women. And Little Women did actually get nominated nominated for Best, best Picture. Greta Garwig, Gerwig sure should have been nominated for Best Director, but we won't go there. But two really awesome female directors, two really awesome film, book-to-film adaptations by two really awesome female authors, whom I absolutely adore. Um, yeah, this is a, I've apparently rabbited on a lot more than I expected to, so I will talk to you all really soon. Bye!